Okay, hello, we are here on Facebook. And I am going to make sure we are here on Facebook. We are absolutely on Facebook. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and I am back with another Facebook Live event for my uh, recent book release, The Best New True Crime Stories, Small Towns. And I am joined by Tom Larson, who's in the Pacific Northwest. Hi, Tom. Hi, Mitzi. Again, nice to finally meet you. Remotely. I know. I know. And this is this is our opportunity to be friendly and sociable and we don't have to worry about masks or being exactly. six feet or more away from each other. Exactly. We're like, the, the, you know, quite a few miles away from each other. So we're safe. <laughs> Great. Oh, well, I'm, I'm really pleased you were able to join me today. Uh, and uh, we're going to chat a bit about your story uh, in the book. Um, Tom wrote a uh, fascinating story, a uh, true crime story called A Tragedy in Pasorgia When People's Justice Goes Horribly Wrong. Now, I hope I said the town's name correctly this time. You did coach me. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a local pronunciation, correct? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's it, most people call it Pasorha because this uh, J is usually pronounced as an H in, uh, in Spanish, but the locals are, for whatever reason, call it Pasorja. They do their own thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many good, there are... Um, Ecuador, the dialect, you know, I learned Spanish in high school, but the Ecuadorian dialect is, is very different, a lot of idioms, and depending on where you are in the country, uh, it's it's different again, you know, so it's, it's difficult to keep up. Oh, oh, and then probably also some slight regional variations as well. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, so you you are actually uh, uh, very off fait with Ecuador. You, you spent many years there, lived and worked in Ecuador, correct? Yes. Uh, well, I retired in uh, 2014, and my wife and I moved to Cuenca, Ecuador. Uh, we had always, um, in the past, for about the past 10 years, you know, we lived in, previous to that, we lived in Portland, but and we love Portland, but it gets rainy and cold in the winter, so we would take a couple of weeks and go to the south, uh, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. And we'd always say, well, you know, this would be a great place to retire. But it was just uh, something you say, you know. And then around 2012, when I was uh, actually starting to think about retiring, a friend of mine sent me an article on Cuenca, Ecuador. I knew a little bit about Ecuador. I'd never heard of Cuenca. But it said it uh, located in the Andes Mountains, 8,500 feet elevation, uh, about 600,000 people. So in 2014, we just sold everything and moved down there. Uh, we didn't really have a long-term plan uh whether we we're going to stay there for a year or, or forever but just like that we were uh, six years and we came back to the northwest for our family our grandkids are growing up and but uh that's i'd been writing for about 25 years but when we moved there of course retired for one thing and i just had more time to write and i really you know kind of got serious about it and then you actually were writing for the um, English language newspaper? That's correct. You know, um, I, like I said, I've been writing for years, but uh, primarily fiction. I've always, uh, I've been a reader. I still read uh, sometimes two books a week, maybe maybe more sometime, but almost always uh, fiction and primarily mysteries. But, um, well, one of the things that when we first talked about moving there, Whatever I used to do, what I used to do whenever we were traveling somewhere, I'd go to the library. Uh, you remember libraries? We used to, you know, um, yeah. I would go to the library and look up uh, literature by, say, Mexican authors, Panamanians. And went up to Nicaragua, I found nothing. And so when I we moved there, I joined a, a group called Club de Libros. It's a uh, basically book book club in Spanish, and we were able to meet, uh, we read books in Spanish. Uh, we were able to meet some really fantastic Ecuadorian authors. Um, and if it's okay, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend JT Nera. He facilitated the book club. Uh, he's going to have heart surgery in the near future. So good luck, mi, mi hermano. Um, yes, exactly. And uh, so I started to have an interest in history and culture of Ecuador and there were a couple of uh, uh, English language newspapers in Cuenca 
so I started writing articles for them and researching and, uh, and again with help from JT. And I heard about this story um, of the, the incident in Pasorgia in uh, right after it happened. I mean, it actually gained worldwide attention for a few days, which is kind of unusual for Ecuador. Um, but I didn't really have an outlet for it until I saw your uh, call for submissions. And I thought, well, this is perfect. Yes. So, it would, yeah, I mean, it really was because when people, uh, you know, pick up a true crime book and uh, they don't necessarily expect to find a true crime story from Ecuador in it. So no. that was a, a real uh, perk to have that included in the book. Um, right. Now, uh, before we get into the story too much, um, again, the, this, the, the subtitle of the story, When People's Justice Goes Horribly Wrong. Can you explain uh, what is meant by people's justice? <clears throat> well, there's a concept in Ecuador, and it's actually uh, framed into the Constitution, and it's called indigenous justice. Um, uh, indigenous people, although they make, you know, fully indigenous people, and they make up about 7% of the population, they have a very strong uh, political clout. Um, and it all goes back to the 1500s, 1600s, when the Spanish overran, uh, took over Ecuador, and they enslaved the people, um, murdered, raped, killed, everything that conquistadores do. But there are a few tribes, uh, some in the high Andes, and notab notably the Shuar in uh, the Amazon, who were just too fierce and too tough. And so the Spanish just more or less let them go. And the people there now live pretty much as they did couple hundred years ago of course they have cell phones and more than the modern technology but um anyway in the constitution it allows them the indigenous people to take justice into their own hands now there are a few notable notable exceptions one being murder kidnapping is another um, those have to be handled by the policia nacional but uh, and then you know the small crimes that are committed in these indigenous communities, they're they're uh, the sentences are like public shaming or whipping with nettles and tree branches or just uh, being tossed out of the community. But over the years, um, mainly uh, I believe because of the police, the police in Ecuador are notably. Mm, corrupt it's almost a cliche of the latin american police you know looking for drives mordita the bite and uh and they don't make you know they're not they're underfunded they're underpaid and so they really don't exercise a lot of uh initiative so the concept of people's justice or tr it was traditional justice and people's justice morphed from this indigenous idea to where now, um, any of the, in the poor communities, the working class communities, it's a common thing. Um, one of the crimes that's kind of uh, prevalent in Ecuador is motorcycle crime, where two men will come on a motorcycle and you know they'll they'll either hop off and rob someone or grab someone's purse and take off. And because the cops really don't do anything, this. Uh, what happens a lot of times, and it happens in Cuenca, it happens all over the country, uh, the people will just gang up and knock these people off their motorcycles, they burn a motorcycle, beat them down. And uh, by the time the cops get there, all there is is like a smoking wreckage of a motorcycle and maybe a couple of bloody days thieves. And the people go back in their homes and this wall of, bring down this wall of silence. They don't talk to the cops. And that's, you know, that's their justice. And yeah. that was really uh, played a big part in this this story, which really turned out to be a tragedy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I could kind of um, see the uh, uh, point of that kind of justice, uh, provided it isn't taken to extremes, as we'll see as we discuss this <laughs> yeah. further. Uh, um, now, uh, so uh, give us a bit of a snapshot of Pesorja. What's, what's it like? Uh, it's, it's, it's really sort of more of a village than, than a town, isn't it? 
Well, uh, it's population about 10,000. Okay, that's pretty big um, for a village then. It's, bigger, it's not really a village. I mean, I, I think I may have referred it to a village in the story, but it's a town. But it's about uh, 75 miles south of Waikil, which is the largest city in the in the country. It's a big uh, port and port city and 3 million population, something like that. Pasorja, like I said, 75 miles south, a uh, small town. Their major um, livelihood is fishing. Uh, shrimp farming is uh, big there. A little bit of tourism, but uh, that's mostly more north. Uh, the whole Ecuadorian coast is beautiful, but it's not, hasn't been spoiled like a lot of other countries, you know, with the high rises and everything. But, um, uh, you know, it's a working class town. It would be, uh, I think, considered a poor by our standards. Uh, the minimum wage in Ecuador, they use the U.S. dollar actually as a currency. Minimum wage in Ecuador is $400 a month. Uh, a policeman probably makes maybe $800 a month. And, you know, granted, it's much cheaper to live in Ecuador, but $800 is still not a lot. And so... They, they supplement their income by, uh, you know, by bribery, basically. I've been pulled over uh, on the coast. It's really prevalent. I had to pay $40. It was gonna, supposed to be a $140 fine. That's I gave the guy $40. Yeah. For those and I went over there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, corruption is, uh, again, it, it seems like a cl cliche, but the highest forms of government, the ex-president who went out of office in 2016 is currently in uh, Belgium uh, escaped he if and he's been tried in absentia if he ever returns to uh, Ecuador he'll go to jail his his, uh, his uh, vice president is in jail there is a big scandal uh, there's a large uh, Brazil Brazilian Brazilian I'm sure uh, construction company they do public works projects all over the South America. They're a multi-billion dollar country, company, I mean, and the way they secure a lot of their uh, their their contracts is bribing the local officials. You know, so that's where the, you know, the, the crux of the story comes, that people just don't trust the police. They figure they're lazy, corrupt, and it's hard to argue with some <laughs> <laughs> that that is that that is another tragedy in itself when yes. it's the when yes. it's the people you're you know supposed to rely on and they're the ones exactly. you know, exactly. <laughs> picking your pockets so to speak yeah. oh and i mean ecuador is a wonderful country people are, are nice it's a beautiful country and hard-working people it's just un, it's unfortunate that they've uh they've made a lot of strides in the last several years but uh their history is just uh, unfortunately, um, pretty dark. Mm, yeah. Um, the events in this story, uh, th these are, this is fairly recent, isn't it? Yeah. 2018, 2018 is when it, when it happened. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so for our listeners, uh, give us an overview of the case. So what exactly, uh, is is this uh, case about this? This all started supposedly from a, a, a little a little uh, robbery, right? Stemmed from a yeah, robbery. Yes. Well, it actually started um, a little bit earlier than that. In August of that year, 2018, a young girl went missing from a barrio in uh, Pasorja. She's 10 years old. Uh, the mother uh, went to the police and they said, well, we'll look into it. And of course they didn't. Um, then it was reported that this girl was seen last seen with uh, a young man, early twenties. Never, he has never been identified. Uh, but he had just moved to the area. He didn't seem to have any family or local connections, and he was viewed as suspicious even before this happened. Um, about three days after the girl went missing, her mother had already gone to Wyatt, killed, gone to the police many, several times. But she got a, a phone call at three o'clock in the morning from her daughter. Uh, her daughter said, you know, mommy, I'm scared. I don't know where I am. And then the phone was disconnected. So she went back to the police station with the phone number and they said, well, we don't have any 
any we're, we don't have the ability to trace this phone find out where it's from and the woman understandably freaked out cried and to one of the officers finally you know felt sorry for her and he called a one of his colleagues in Wyakill where they do have the technology and they found out that um <clears throat> the girl was uh the pay phone was called from a pay phone in a bus station in uh, chone which is about 300 miles north of of Pazorgen. uh they've got the girl back um she was no she was in no shape to you know identify who abducted her or what happened she was just distraught and a week about a week later this young man came back came back suddenly to this town the mother went to the police and they said well you know we can't do anything because we haven't didn't catch him in the act they didn't even interview him so about another week passed and a second girl disappeared uh and she was um she finally located in loja province it's about 500 miles south southeast of there so and the young man has never been seen again he never returned as far as we know but in october uh two women were taking their kids to school they walked them to school every day it's a common occurrence and uh and to backtrack just a bit in the absence of any action by the police uh the citizens kind of formed facebook pages social media and so if anybody you know it turned out if a kid was an hour late getting home from school they would circulate it and, you know and they were always found but again in october uh these women took their kids to school dropped them off waved goodbye and were heading back home and a woman approached them tried to sell them a ring uh which is probably of course stolen uh they declined they kept walking and a car pulled up with two men in it and they got out and they drugged the two women with scopolamine scopolamine is uh it's a tasteless odorless powder it's made from the flower of the borrachero tree and it's used throughout ecuador uh, colombia and peru and what it does it can be put in a drink or a food the most common way is uh the uh, attacker will take a, a piece of paper and, and put the powder on it and just blow it into people's face. And it uh, acts very quickly and turns the victims into zombies. And oh they'll do, they just do whatever they're told to do. They, you know, it's not uncommon for them to go to the ATM and empty their bank accounts. As you, you know, they're raped. They're, uh, some extreme cases, they their organs are harvested you know so um anyway one of the the the, the men um uh, and this other woman the original woman so there's three of them they eventually robbed the two women of uh their cell phones and like a couple hundred dollars and uh one of the women one of the women had just received a slight dose of the scopolamine so she kind of played along but when the men left, the men and the woman left, she was able to contact the police quickly. And the uh, <clears throat> trio was arrested and taken to the police station in Pazorja. Uh, and I visited Pazorja after the fact, and there's a police station, it's just a small concrete block building. Um, and, and all, so the three, uh, these three attackers, robbers actually were taken to this uh, small building and held until someone could come from Wyakill to take them there to face you know to be arraigned a face trial and everything like that but in the meantime you know social media did it did its job uh and like you know publicizing this crime and like often happens in social media uh the facts just got distorted um these kids, the the parent, the parents dropped their kids off. The kids were in school; they were safe. But word got around that uh, the kids had been attacked, possibly abducted, and one, a few people said, "Well, they had been killed." So the the arrest was made before eleven o'clock. They were put in the in they were in this uh, held in this um, police station. They weren't handcuffed. They weren't in a cell. They were just there. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, two thousand people out in the streets, uh, you know, protesting and wanted access to the, you know, wanted to 
get these people out. And uh, the police, they're kind of, you know, uh, protests break out in Ecuador at the drop of a hat. They were used to it, so they just locked the door and closed. But this this crowd was, you know, they were hardcore. They uh, poured gasoline. They put gasoline all over the front door, set it on fire. And when the glass shattered, they rushed in. In the meantime, uh, some of them had got on the roof. They took off air conditionings, dropped down from the ceiling. And the cops are just overwhelmed. Uh, I, I did man, I talked to one of the young officers who was there at the time. And he said at that time, he had just joined the force. He wasn't even allowed to have a gun. So he hid behind a desk. And one of his best friends was whacked over the head with an iron bar. Uh, he lived and, you know, he's okay. But, but they were just overwhelmed. And so these, this mob drug those three people out into the street, right in front of the police station, stripped them nude for whatever reason, beat the crap out of them, set them on fire, set them on fire, um, and, and, uh, and eventually killed them. They took uh, chunks of concrete from the sidewalk and bashed them over the head. Uh, uh, two, a couple of policemen were hurt, a couple of... A couple of soldiers were hurt, they were called it. And a police car and a taxi and three or four motorcycles were just burnt, obliterated. And by the time they called out for reinforcements from the local army fort, by the time the army got there, these people were dead and, and most of the crowd had, you know, had dissipated. So that, you know, and so the, the, the whole point of it is that you know, when people hear about something like that, they think, oh, okay, there's people are child molesters, murderers, you know. So maybe, you know, there's a little part of you that says, hey, good for the good, good. They got what they deserve. But the reality is these three people were, you know, small time criminals. They weren't murderers. They weren't child abductors. They weren't pedophiles. And they were killed just, I mean, you have to say it at the, it was because of the police indifference, you know. They try to defend themselves after the fact. The police said, "Well, we didn't have riot gear. We didn't have this." But you know, it's a it was a perpetual thing that people didn't trust, and they still don't trust the police. Um, I won't, like I said, I went there in uh, 2019, spent a day talking around, and uh, you know, most of the people that I was able to talk to. They said, well, you know, their, their attitude was, you know, well, yeah, it was unfortunate that these people were innocent. But at the same time, the cops don't do anything. They're lazy, corrupt, and we have to do it. And I talked to a taxi driver, and he said that he told me about a, another incident that just happened, you know, a month before I was there, where a, um, a guy in another town stole someone's pickup truck, and they killed him. I was never able to really verify that, but you hear stories like that all along, all the time. And, and you know, in that class of society, the poor socioeconomic class, I guess you'd say, it's common and they really don't see anything wrong with it. Well, in this particular case, the, the three individuals who are being held in the jail, um, now these were just the, the, the people that uh, essentially uh, robbed the, the, the two women, right? Exactly. They, they had nothing to do with any any child uh, kidnapping, no. child molestation, or nothing anything like that. Yeah. So, so this somehow then then uh, uh, the role of social media twisted it. Is is that how oh, this? Exa oh, exactly. Yeah. It just became I mean, like that, that one little thing that somebody said one thing, and then it just grew into something mm -hmm. that um, had nothing to do with what these nothing three people. Nothing to do with were. what these people did, you know. That's really that's that's pretty damn scary. I mean, I mean, okay, like yeah, nobody's saying it's it's okay to go and rob, uh, you know, two women and blow uh, drugs in their yeah. face to zombify them but you know the, the, from that a, to not a capital crime yeah and, 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 then, um, and at that you know the, the, level. yeah there were two men and a woman a woman the two uh the one man and woman were in a relationship and they had four children between them mm. the older man had an 18 year old son who has cerebral palsy and all the kids were the grandparents had to step in and, and take them over. Um, and uh, they just, 
they've been, you know, try, cr trying, crying, I guess, for justice for years. There were eventually uh, eight people were arrested for this. Um, both of the grandparents say that they saw the video of the beating and the person who actually struck the final blow on, on their son is not, has not been arrested. Uh, the court granted 15,000, the, the three, uh, the people that were arrested were supposed to uh, pay $15,000 a piece in restitution to the families, but it's been, uh, it, it never, it was never finalized, which is some weird thing about the Ecuadorian justice system. So these people are uh, living on, on basically nothing. The one uh, grandmother who has the disabled child, cerebral palsy, she uh, she works for, she makes some sort of crafts at home. She, her income is only, it's less than minimum wage, a couple hundred dollars a month. She gets some money from, uh, because of the grand, the grandson's disability, but it's just it's just not enough. Well, even even if uh, they they uh, got that through with the restitution of fifteen thousand dollars, I I doubt that they would even have the fifteen thousand dollars to pay. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So just, that, uh, that would be a huge amount of money, I would assume. Oh yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, it really is. Well, I mean, I think I think what's really relevant about this case and, and you know, we, we're seeing so much right now and I'm not going to name names, but we all know who we're talking about. Um, <laughs> social media being used and abused, uh, fake news perpetuated, misinformation campaigns, and this stuff just goes like wildfire. And, mm -hmm. and suddenly the truth is no longer the truth and you have a lot of people believing things that are not the truth. And in this particular case, this is this seems to be what actually occurred from something that was a probably a very common street crime. You know, you, you go sure. and you rob two women. I mean, that, that's quite common in Latin America um, yeah. to suddenly uh, having the, the people who are arrested um, being held up as child molesters and, and kidnappers uh, from, you know, yeah. from one extreme to the other, that none of it was true. And where did it even come from? Exactly. You know, I remember when uh, Facebook was uh, new and um, people were afraid of just this thing. But I remember the, that uh, it was a young woman in Iran who was beaten by the caliphate or whatever they called them. And she was able to show her last minutes on Facebook. And, you know, I thought that was, I mean, that was great. I mean, Facebook, you can't, I don't know, you can't blame Facebook. I don't, I don't think because it's a, it allows, you know, allows me to contact people that are hundreds of thousands of miles away. But as always, uh, it just kind of devolves into something terrible. So. Yeah, I don't I mean, know what you know, the answer I mean, is. But. Well, I know because I mean the, the people who initially uh, were using Facebook, and I know in your story you have where um, uh, was it was it someone at the police was saying that Facebook is something that is important because they can get word out about things like so and so is missing or whatever, yeah. and it does help uh, get the information out there, and it still does. I mean, um, yeah. you know, Twitter as well. I mean, uh, not that this has anything to do with it, but you know, like I often get involved with reposting things like for animal rescue and stuff. And the information sure. does get bounced out there. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, it serves a really excellent function and it's just a shame that uh, it's been uh, abused and, and turned into something that it shouldn't be, you know, yeah. and in this, this is the most extreme case whatsoever. I mean, yeah. these three people and, and um, uh, essentially mob justice, because this is not even just a indigenous justice, it's mob justice. It's exactly. A yeah. mob of people outside the yeah. police station. And, you know, and the fact is probably none of the 2000 people there were truly indigenous. Uh, most people in Ecuador identify as mestizo, which is, you know, uh, the indigenous people mixed with the Spanish blood, but they certainly willing to take it. And I guess, you know, in the absence of social media, you know, in these small towns, people, it would have just taken a little longer, I guess, yeah. to, to get the uh, word out, but it would have probably may have resulted in the same thing. You know, uh, we all see the old movies about people with pitchforks and, you know, how did that get around? So, 
Well, yeah, exactly. It, it, I, I also think it probably would have resulted in the same way as well, because the, the, the rumors would just be passed from, you know, one ho household to the next to the next, each mm -hmm. time being more embellished and, yeah. and more false. And, yeah. uh, you know, but like you said, exactly, it wouldn't have been as organized. Right. It was quick, but it may have quick. happened anyway. <laughs> so quick that no one had time to do anything about it, which is right. um, pretty sad. Um, yeah. So, so the so the little police station there is is still the same little police station, but yeah. repaired. <laughs> they repaired it, but it's the same, you know, it's the same thing. And I mean, this could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, and it does. You know, it, it happens. Uh, there were there were several uh, incidents in Quito, which is the capital that happened around that time um of, you know people being dragged out in the street and you know brutally beaten uh, i don't know i'm sure it's well i'm sure it's happened that people died other than this case you know but um uh, there was a when i did some research for the book there's an organization uh called ine i believe which is the national in, uh, in, in spanish or well, in english should be the national in, international uh, statistical bureau and they said that uh, Guatemala and Bolivia uh, which have a really high higher indigenous population than Ecuador have experienced this uh, uh, 10 or 12 fold uh, rise in incidents um, in the last 10 years and Ecuador and Colombia at least according to this uh, uh, this uh, article that I read has this actually decreased but you know it's still there and probably will be <laughs> yeah it probably will be I, you know because everything just is the the corruption is, is the big thing in, you know, in ecuador i mean i keep coming back to that you know i lived there six years and i love the people i really other than the 40 dollars i had to pay for you know a traffic violation uh <laughs> i uh you know, they probably had a party that night. I don't know, but I never <laughs> really experienced it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Most of it. laughs> well, I mean, that, that seems to be such a common thing with the, with the, with the corruption, either the police corruption or political corruption. I was, I was reading, um, uh, 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 uh one book set in Africa was was it um, the Theroux chap who writes all those incredible books and oh, you yeah. know the same yeah. thing and and other other countries you know you just like if you turn down the wrong street um, you know the, the what was, oh yes he the one he wrote about Mexico that exactly the same thing like if you just ended up going down the wrong block there you get stopped for for completely bogus reasons and made to pay <laughs> or you can't you know or it's jail so. Yeah. So I could I could see that, and it's a shame. It's really a shame that um, it's like that. And one would hope yeah. it will it at some point. Some point, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We we may not like to see it, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Yeah, I mean, we we complain about the corruption in the political system in the United States, and it it's bad. But boy, when you you think of some of these other countries, it's. Uh, they have a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Um, so, with, so with 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 regard to your story, I mean, um, so so you you sort of knew about this case. I mean, you you didn't necessarily. Um, uh, I mean, when you you chose to write about this case as opposed to perhaps some other things, because it sounds like there was quite a lot of fodder there to choose from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the story um, because you know, from time to time you hear about this happening and. You know, traditional people's justice you know but uh, i read a there's a magazine a very good magazine in, in ecuador called vistazo and they publish a lot of good investigative stories and i read the the story and you know when i because I, when i first heard about it again like a lot of people i think there's a part of you that says you know okay these people got what they deserve but then when i found out that they were these people were innocent and so it became a you know something that i had in the back of my mind but i didn't really have a uh, an outlet for it again until i saw your uh, call for submissions and you know it's just perfect story is perfect yeah, uh, yeah. True crime, small town <laughs> yeah and definitely a different uh, a different uh, take on it um well i mean it, it definitely is a tragedy and and uh it certainly wasn't the kind of people's justice that i don't i don't 
I, I, I would I would be interested to know what the people who participated in in this form of justice actually feel now that they know the truth and that these people that they killed were well yeah. they were just little street robbers just yeah petty <laughs> yeah and like I said I went you know I went there in uh, 2019 I think about it and I talked to a few people you know my Spanish is not that great but I can communicate and uh and most of them didn't really want to talk too much about it, but I did talk to a taxi driver and he was very upfront about it. And he said, basically he said, yeah, and that's a shame. And some people died, but it was the fault of the police, the fault of the system. He didn't blame, you know, he didn't blame any of the people there. I and mean, for all I know, he might've been, may have been one yeah. that was in the group, you know, but yeah. Um, any, I didn't hear anybody. I spoke to a few people, and you know, other than the one cop I talked to, and he didn't really condemn it. But I've never heard anybody really condemn the idea behind it. He said, you know, we, we're the cops don't do it. What are we going to? What are we supposed to do? You know, and like even I said, though the one driver I talked to at quite a length, you know, and he said, yes, it's sad, but. He didn't seem that sad, you know. Nobody was too, uh, uh, didn't feel any sense of shame that the fact is that really the the, the justice they sought was uh, incorrectly. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's a bit scary that's, as well. That is I really mean, you scary. Know, you, if, you, if, you, if you kill someone by accident, you know, the normal thing is to sort of say, oh, my God, you know, what have I done? I, I feel horrible. I, you know, really have some <laughs> sense of regret yeah. and shame. <laughs> Yeah, but it seems that yeah. didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I wasn't able to interview any of the people that were actually arrested, and I, there's doesn't seem to be much information about them. So I don't know how they feel. They probably feel just, they. I'm assuming they're sorry they got caught, but they feel justified. They, they may they actually did. still believe those people uh, were guilty of something other than just yeah. street that robbery. Seems, yeah. You know, you get it into your head and then you sort of you created your own uh, story and that's the story you're sticking to. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, dear. It's a very sad case, but, uh, you know, and, and uh, the um, the, uh, the I can't remember her name now, but she's the head of the actually national police defended the police to the end. They said, you know, we we're just, they were just overwhelmed. They didn't, they weren't ready to, or equipped, you know, to handle this. But uh, that's beside the point, really. The point is they had a chance to, you know, at least if they had, I think at least investigated uh, the, the disappearance of the two girls back in August, if they had launched an actual investigation, even if they never found the culprit, I think it would have helped build a little trust, and you know, in the and so there's this um, when they, when they didn't, the people said, you know, they set up Facebook pages uh, just devoted to you know crime of this nature, and they, you know, and it's it's not inconceivable that these Facebook groups actually uh, saved some, you know, or prevented some crimes because. Um, you know, the, the word was out and, you know, uh, sexual trafficking, uh, pedophilia, uh, sexual trafficking mostly is very, very common in Ecuador. And, you know, young girls, and young boys are, are taken all the time. So if, uh, you know, if you, if you're a sexual tra sex trafficker or whatever, and you live in Pazorgia and you see this big uh, social media presence, you know, looking at you all the time, you might think about going somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. so you can't, I can't quantify that, but you know, it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the two girls then. So, so what actually happened with the, the, the now the one little girl, uh, you, I remember you saying that she phoned her mom and was saying, uh, you know, that, so she, she was recovered, right. Mm -hmm. And then uh -huh. the other one that went missing. Yeah, she was recovered in uh, Loja province, which is about 500 miles oh, yeah. east, you know, and uh, they, yes, according to whatever, they have uh, been given counseling and, you know, there are some, uh, some uh, resources to try to help them recover. Uh, the two women who, who's, who were drugged and 
and called the police and, and identified the robbers there in uh, um, witness protection you know, because uh, the the families of the of the people who are killed blame them in some way and they've had death threats and so it's just a big circle of yeah. uh, of terribleness. I don't know well, yeah, I could see right that word. everybody wants to blame someone and 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 lash yeah. out at someone. And so, I mean, yeah, I could see that the two women who were just victims themselves are now being targeted by, mm -hmm. yeah, what a mess. it's a total mess is what it is. Oh my goodness. Um, well, um, in closing, let me just ask you, uh, do you have anything you would like to mention that you're working on now? Uh, I know you have something coming up in my third book. Yes, yes, uh, uh, yeah, another year, hopefully we'll be doing this. Um, I've been, I primarily write short stories. I have a few books up on Kindle. You can search Tom Larson on Amazon Kindle. If, uh, but, you know, I, I'm sure you know the Kindle, anybody can put a book on Kindle, but it's a matter of, <laughs> you know, um, selling them. But I would, if it's okay, I'd like to call everyone's attention to this book. Um, it's called The Return, uh, and it's by Achilles Himbo, Himbo Cordova. He's an Ecuadorian author, and he wrote the, orig the original book was called El Retorno, and I was uh, fortunate enough to translate it into english so the english and spanish versions are both up on my amazon page and this is a story of uh uh set in the 1950s and 60s in loja province which uh it was kind of about the time that um uh, you know it was primarily uh people in ecuador lived in the country and that was about the time that city started to grow up and this family was forced to go to the city they were quite happy in Loja, in the province, you know, but floods, uh, droughts, and they went to Loja, which is the capital of the province, and uh, they're met with the same disdain and everything that migrants all over the world are. It's a fictional account, but it has a lot of uh, history, and it's called The Return because the father, particularly with the mother, father, and two young children, uh, all he ever wanted to do was return to his home in Loha. And he finally did, but it wasn't, well, <laughs> wasn't quite thought. the same. But anyway, yeah. I'd just like to publicize that. As I said, there's uh, some really awesome Ecuadorian writers. They just haven't got, primarily because of the government, uh, it's been uh, one totalitarian government after another. They don't, they just don't get the recognition like, you know, uh, Lorca and Marquez and all those Borges, all those great writers from other parts of South America. Yeah, that's so. a shame. That's a shame. Well, maybe some people watching this will be inspired to at least try to uh, seek out more I <laughs> books so, from yeah. that region I hope and so. writers from that region. So, yeah. um, so, but so I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Tom's got a story that'll be coming up in. Um, my third volume, uh, which is uh, the best new true crime stories, well-mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. And yeah. uh, that is another story set in Latin America, but I won't say anything more about it because I want okay. people to be excited and buy the book and it's Absolutely. available to pre-order. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you again, Tom. Uh, again, to those of you uh, watching, uh, I've been speaking with Tom Larson, who's written a story for the best new true crime stories, small towns and a fascinating story set in Ecuador where he lived for many years and uh, was a journalist. So thanks so much for joining me. And uh, I, I will, I'm sure we'll chat again when the next book comes out. I, I hope so. That was very great. It was nice to meet you and uh, I enjoyed it. Thank um, you, Tom. And yeah. thanks everyone for tuning in. Okay. Bye. Bye.